Hello and welcome to my ray tracing project. My name is Simon Evenhuis and I'm a high schooler from Austria. Last year, when Apple released the Apple Vision Pro, there was something that really caught my attention. Apple Vision Pro also features our most advanced spatial audio system ever. Personalized sound is delivered directionally to your ear. And audio ray tracing uses sophisticated sensors to understand the materials and objects in your room. So sound feels like it's coming from the world around you. Even though the visual was in the script, might not be the most physically accurate, it inspired me to do this project and got me thinking, can I build something like that? But this wasn't even the first time audio managed to fascinate me. I remember watching demos of Dolby Atmos, which truly really make you feel like you're part of the scene. It catches all the little details puts you in the center of the action. Audio isn't just an afterthought. It has the potential to change the way you consume digital content. And so my quest to build a system that can simulate sound on my own began. After a bit of research, I realized that there are many different ways of going about this. Some approaches, like volumetric sound simulation or acoustic radiosity, are incredibly accurate and immersive but they require a huge amount of computing power, which I don't have, and thus make real-time applications almost impossible. That's why I chose audio ray tracing. While it may not be the most physically accurate, it was something I could wrap my head around. And after Apple's ad, it also seemed like the most appealing. Let's start with a little explanation of sound and how we hear. These little points represent air molecules. Sound begins as vibrations traveling through air, creating waves of pressure, I model these sound waves as sound waves. They carry energy and their speed, amplitude and shape determine how we perceive the sound. These waves reach our ears and through a series of mechanisms are converted to signals our brains can process. What really makes sound fascinating is how we use both ears to make sense of the world around us. One way we localize sound is through phase delay. When the sound comes from one side, it reaches the closer ear slightly earlier than the further one. Our brains use a signing timing difference to figure out the direction of the sound. Let's add some phase delay to the right ear, which makes it go left. And if we add the phase delay to the left ear, it will go to the right. But this isn't the only cue your brain uses. Your head creates a shadow and therefore one ear hears the sound quieter than the other. But there's more to the story. Localization in the vertical plane and front-back discrimination require an analysis of spectral shape hues that arise from direction-dependent reflections within the pinna. What this means is that your brain uses all these little details in your ear to localize sound. In fact, people with just one ear can still localize sound. Let's look at something more practical. In most applications, sound interacts with walls or other objects. Sound can be reflected, transmitted, or absorbed. The way this happens depends on the material of the wall. For example, a brick wall might reflect most of the sound, while a wooden one absorbs and transmits more. Now, let's dive into my implementation. Here's the update function, which gets called during every iteration. The section we're focusing on is responsible for ray tracing and generating the audio. First, we calculate the direction of the ray based on the iteration index. This determines where each ray is cast. Once that's done, we call this function trace ray to handle the actual ray tracing. This whole loop could be parallelized and even run on a GPU. However, since this isn't a real world project, I've kept it like this for simplicity's sake. The function starts by addressing the two termination conditions, which are reaching the maximum amount of bounces or having intensity too low to still matter. The function then iterates over all walls to find the closest point of intersection. The ray wall intersection is calculated using simple vector math that I will not be going over in this video. Before interacting with walls, the ray checks if it's close enough to the audio source. If it is and it meets all the other conditions, then we add it to the audio paths, which we will use to compute the sound. Otherwise, if it doesn't pass close enough to the audio source, 
and it doesn't hit a wall, then its journey ends at the edge of the screen. We then calculate the intensity using the inverse square law. After that, we handle the diffraction, which we will look at later. Then there's reflection and transmission, which you should remember from earlier. When a ray hits a wall, we calculate its intensity again based on the wall's properties, things like reflectivity and absorption. If the remaining intensity is still high enough, we create a new ray. One that is reflected spectrally and one that continues in its direction on the other side of the wall. In reality, light doesn't reflect perfectly like this. It scatters in many directions, but for now, we're simplifying it with specular reflections. Then we call a trace ray function for our two new rays. Each time we do this, we also decrement our remaining bounces, letting the ray eventually stop. Let's take a look at audio generation. I did decide to make this asynchronous because otherwise it wouldn't be performant enough to change the location of the listener in real time. But don't worry about the weight groups and all that if you don't know Golang. In principle, we continuously fill buffers with wave points that are played in sequence. Each point takes up four bytes total, two bytes for the left channel and two bytes for the right channel, giving us stereo audio. We use 44,100 of these points every second, and each buffer represents a small slice of audio that gets played before we fill and play the next buffer. This process repeats to create continuous sound. Let's break down the code. We start by looping over the paths that hit the audio source. From there, we calculate the ILD, which tells us how much louder the sound is in one ear compared to the other. In reality, this will vary depending on the frequency and is modeled in a more complex way, using something called an HRTF, or Head Related Transfer Function. Here, we calculate the angle of the sound source relative to the listener's position using arctan, and then adjust it a bit to account for the listener's orientation. After that, we calculate the shadow effect. We return a factor by which we can later multiply our amplitude. After that, we go over the buffer and fill every point with the sum of all paths, adjusted with delay, ILD, and general volume. You might remember me talking about diffraction. Well, I haven't quite figured that out yet. Let me clarify. Diffraction in sound is the bending and spreading of sound waves as they encounter obstacles or pass through openings. This allows sound to travel around corners, through doorways, and even be heard behind barriers. I tried simulating this by splitting up the rays to come close to the edge, and even that implementation is quite lackluster because it just distributes them equally. And if I wanted to remove these gaps, I would have to bring up the amount of rays for each fraction, which is really inefficient. The new rays should also be more focused on the actual shadow area, and the other rays should be pulled towards it too. To be more physically accurate, I would have to implement something like the Kirchhoff or Fresnel diffraction. These are a lot more accurate, but they are also wave-based instead of ray-based. When ray tracing light, which is the more common use, then diffraction can be ignored because it depends on wavelength and in visible spectrum, it is negligible. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you have a great day. Bye.